uh, I just ask you to be brief in the, in the questions and then we have time for, for discussions and more questions. Uh, uh, is there anyone interested? Yes, James? Hi, James Stiller from UNU Wider. Um, to, to the first speaker from, from Tunisia, um, I worry a lot about using historical data to make uh, projections about what um, climate policy might do for economic growth, for example. Because, I mean, as we've been hearing from a lot of people, we're talking about a, a revolution or a transformation, a new way of doing things. And so, to some extent, your, um, your economic structure of your economy is built on the back of old energy prices. If you significantly alter those energy prices, you change the structure, you transform the economy. And so, the losses that, uh, that, that you project uh, in, in growth or, or, or GDP may be um, quite overstated um, because we may have a, a significant shift in the, in, in the whole structure of, of the economy, a transformation. Okay, you just pick up a few more questions, if anyone else? No? Okay, and then maybe you could answer this question while we see if anyone else would be interested in this question. Uh, uh, this is a good question, yes. Uh, but uh, here the, the my, uh, study is not based in the projections. It's based in the, to study the, only the relationship uh, or the causality between uh, the transport energy consumption and the transport value added and the CO2 emissions, but not uh, a model for do the uh, to construct a scenarios and to simulate the effect on the uh, if there is uh, an increase of energy consumption, what's the effect on economic growth or on transport uh, value added? And maybe the question also to integrate the, pri the price, the energy prices with the, also the other variable is uh, a good idea. Maybe to, uh, to see what's the effect on, uh, of the energy prices on uh, energy consumption. But the problem, even in Tunisia or in uh, developing countries, energy prices are not really high to maybe usually we ask to increase the energy price and the last uh, month the ener the government has increased the energy prices to reduce for to, because uh, it has uh, a lack of uh, uh, public finance but uh, even in tunisia when we increase the energy prices does not affect really the, the consumption of uh, in the road transport because uh, road transport mainly is based in uh, fossil uh, fuels. Mainly, this is why uh, I, uh, I want to, uh, we want to study the relationship between energy consumption and, uh, uh, and transport value added to see whether if uh, we reduce energy uh, energy consumption using uh, instrument economics carbon taxes. If there is uh, a reduction on transport value added here, there is mainly. And when uh, in this case, uh, uh, reducing energy consumption in the transport sector is not uh, a good uh, policy. Maybe the development of uh, infra infrastructure or the investment in infrastructure or the also the development of uh, the uh, renewable resources maybe will be better than uh, uh, reducing fossil fuel energy consumption. Comment? No. No, no. Okay, we have a question in the back. And anyone else? Just get one by one. Thank you very much. My question is directed. If you could introduce yourself. Okay, uh, I'm Bola Awutide from uh, University of Ibadan, Nigeria. Uh, my question is for uh, Daramola from Nigeria. Um, it was indeed a very beautiful presentation and it, it, a bit the, the division from what we usually have in terms of climate change. Uh, Why your recommendation is quite, uh, quite uh, plausible in the sense that you were trying to introduce uh, the use of uh, public uh, transport in order to mitigate or reduce the climate change effect. However, I want to ask, you know, looking at your data, having introduced the BRT in Lagos, uh, which you also presented in your paper, uh, has there been a reduction in the 
carbon dioxide emission as a result of that. So whereby this will be able to uh, maybe allow your policy recommendation to have a, a good, to be a good one. Thank you for the question. Reductions in carbon dioxide emissions, we don't measure annually. That would, it's, in fact, carbon dioxide emission figures are not, um, I, 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 they're not, they're not as um, composite as they should be in Nigeria. This is just from the transport sector. We do have emissions from fossil fuels, but I can't say precisely that, we, that there has been there, there, there's been an analysis of what how the how the emissions have reduced or increased since BRT was in, introduced. BRT was introduced only 2008, and it's only accounting for 2.3 percent of trips. So if it's going to have any significant effect at all, it has to be promoted. And I I'm kind of pose a question to the speakers, to, to any of them. It's interesting, the quote uh, that I, uh, I saw another day that's saying, a developed country is not a place where the poor have cars. It is where the rich use public or non-motorized transportation. Uh, in your opinion, what kind of transformations you need, in, particularly in cities, uh, in order to, to make this a reality? Yeah, but what what uh, what kind of public transport? Sorry, what kind of transformation? Do you need? Yeah, to make this a reality, make uh, actually it's like the, the the that the poor don't need a car to get to the uh, uh, everyone needs a car to actually access to transportation. Where they actually the rich, the people that get rich, then they they be willing to use the public transportation. Not just the question of maybe giving the. The, the roads or giving the, the BRT, but how to actually put these people on the buses. Yeah, I think the only way to do, it, to do that in Nigeria is to provide incentives for public transport use and disincentives for private car use. If we have parking charges, for example, even in office complexes, um, leaving, leaving the private car is, is going to be hard work for any policymaker to achieve in Lagos. Because the car owner syndrome is very strong in, in, in a city like Lagos. Everybody wants to be comfortable, and there's a strong and growing middle class. And since public transport is not as decent, they just have to go for a private car. So the public transport must be made decent. If it's decent enough, competitive, if there are priority lanes for them, and, and people are experiencing reduced trip times, you know, using the buses, and then they have to pay if they use the private car, then they might consider leaving their cars. Yes, uh, that's a pretty interesting question. Uh, uh, such transformations are already seen, for example, if you look at Delhi, for example, they have created a system where um, uh, uh, different sections of the society have started using, uh, say, metro in, in Delhi. Uh, your question being, um, as the people's income level increases, even how to draw them towards public transportation. Anyway, poor people are using public transportation for their needs. Yeah. As they grow in, on income ground, how to draw them towards public transport is you have to incentivize them by means of uh, travel time. I think cutting down on travel time is one of the major incentives for them to use public transport, if not for the comfort of not driving themselves. Uh, for example, in Mumbai, for, uh, for a person to travel uh, to go to work, they would prefer a metro, the, the rail system, compared to driving themselves because it cuts down the travel time by 50%. That's why Mumbai traditionally is a metro, metro city to begin with. I think such incentivization uh, uh, in, within the system is more important to draw people towards public transportation than um, you know, talking about the quality of it and all that. Quality arguments it subsequently, but I think such uh, that's that's what is my opinion about how to draw people towards public transportation. Mm. For the development of uh, transport, public also in Tunisia is a problem. For example, <laughs> why uh, transport sector uh, the transport public uh, sector is not developed? For example, in Tunisia, for the reason I think say. Because the the company 
which sell the cars are mainly uh, the, pri uh, the private property for the 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 policy makes <laughs> if we develop the, the the transport public they cannot sell the the cars this is this is the mainly the, the main problem for not develop to not de develop the transport uh, public mm. the mainly uh, the main reason why transport public is not uh, developed and there's a question, uh, let's try to address the issue that you mentioned before, that not only provide the public transportation, but I think you need the disincentive for uh, using cars. For example, you have Singapore that people see in an example, they have a lot of disincentives, high tax on car, and also the, the, the congestion charge like London and others, but the number of cars is increasing even with this, because now people can afford. And actually, uh, I was reading also in China, in China, they, they are projecting it's going to have 800 million cars in 20 years. Uh, where on the streets you're going to put 800 million cars? I was reading even Volkswagen, the, the president of Volkswagen say, okay, it's our main market now, but you have to start thinking you're going to have 800 million cars, maybe people you think that's not, uh, uh, and the idea is how actually you make this balance disincentivize the use of cars uh, towards public transportation. I think this is also key, not only provide the public transportation, but find a way that you could uh, uh, make people not ha having their cars, because if not, they, the tenders that they're going to use. Like, uh, and in many countries now, you have uh, issues uh, related to uh, where you park those cars. China is one I was uh, in city in China, big city, and now the cars where bikes go before, now we have car parking, and the people actually walk on the street, and a few bikes so that they walk on the street because like the, the sidewalks are used for, for the cars. And then, and then what kind of transformation? I, I know that the issue uh, related to fuel or, or income affects the, the way people do transportation, but I think there are other paths of development that you, you need to start looking at, particularly in the transportation sector, uh, as you urbanize. You know, and then this should be an important point. The problem in, in a developing country, the number of uh, cars for, uh, by habitant is low than, more low than the, in the developed countries. For example, if we take China and uh, France, I think in France uh, for five people there is a car. Mm. If in China uh, for five people there is a car, it will be a problem in all the world. Mm. So the, the, it will be a problem for the, for climate, uh, mainly for climate change. Mm. This is why we will, uh, if we, uh, for example, for all the world, if we, uh, is, uh, if we try to, to to have a problem, mainly the problem is to will to invest in other sources of energy for cars, for example, for the biofuels mm. and the development of infrastructure for the, the development of uh, transport uh, public in mainly in the mm. develop, uh, developing. Uh, countries which are uh, populated like Nigeria, India, or Pakistan. I think you've got uh, you get the question. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and you can. Yeah. Uh, uh, you made a remark, uh, uh, interesting remark, that Singapore, uh, the number of cars is rising in Singapore in spite of disincentivizing the owning a car. That's actually draws focus on the fact that as long as the uh, United States have two cars on an average per household, when another state uh, increasing their per capita incomes and people always wish to have their own car. So in a way, out of box one has to think, instead of disincentivizing owning a car, it is better to present a, a situation where they have easy access to public transport. They may have a car, but they may not use it as often as they use it today because the access to public transport is not as good. I think we can't control people from having car because they have desire and they have income. Uh, no incentive would be a long-term effect in that. I think instead of the uses can be controlled by you know, make access to public transport more easy. That's what compact cities talks, uh, talks about, is it? Uh, thank you.
All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Akindeji Falaki um, from um, Abuja, Nigeria. Well, um, I just wanted to make a comment. Uh, I've not heard any of the three presenters who've looked at the nexus between public transport or transport generally and climate change as being a contributing factor and also transportation um, being at the receiving end of climate change. And I'm just wondering why, maybe I didn't hear that, nobody has really promoted the good old walking, um, as simple as that. Or even taking um, motorcycles, uh, um, bicycles, um, as simple as that. I, I know Lagos, I know massive cities, um, including the other city, but uh, so many other uh, positive things we can get because we're talking about development, health issues, um, you probably will be stronger, probably will be healthier. And sometimes we, if we really also make it, promote it in a way that people can accept that I can take a straw, why take um, um, a motorcycle that, and the motorcycles we have in Nigeria, two-stroke engine, very poisonous uh, emissions. So maybe, uh, I, I think we, sh we can also have that, right? You can just take a walk. Why hop into a vehicle or, or something and then use of bicycles, at least for, sh for short distances? Okay, Thank you, you have now James, I think you want to compliment really. Me again, James. Um, I guess a question to, to the presentation on, on India. I mean, you, you gave some estimates on how much carbon might be um, avoided if, uh, or, or wouldn't be emitted if we can make the switch, say, to non-motorized transport and, and so on. And I, I wonder, and it's talking about changing behavior and how difficult that is, and you recognize that yourself. And, and so inside some of your calculations, you must have made some, some assumptions about how behavior might change. And I'm wondering, how easy is it in, in your, uh, maybe from your knowledge, or, or, or um, how, how easy would you imagine it to be, to be able to convince something like Jeff to give you money to, to invest in these kind of projects when you know you're making assumptions about human behavior that maybe, as Jose was saying, they, they just simply will not change? Okay. If you want, because this is interesting, if you could develop a path Cities like the developing world here get Copenhagen. Copenhagen developed what putting cars on the street and certain point like 20, 30 years ago started going back to walk on bicycle. Now they promote bicycle. But I mean they have this curve. But actually developing countries had, like countries have tradition to use bicycle. China and others have seen it losing this tradition to use cars. But later on in the future they, they may have go have go back, invest to actually get the bikes back, but how actually avoid this path that... Uh, and, and this is a comment. The first question about uh, walking. Yes, 80% uh, uh, of work trips made by urban slum, urban poor people in Mumbai uh, is scattered by walking. Means 80% of people going for work go by walk. So walking is always there, it's not uh, discounted, okay? Uh, in my presentation also, as I mentioned, NMT, that essentially includes walking as well, okay? So by promoting this so-called urban poor, using walking as a mode to go to work, uh, right now the conditions are not good enough. But if you make the conditions better, even the non-poor could actually work. For example, access to the metro station, people could walk if the conditions are good. So we always promote walking. It's not discounted at any point in time. Coming to the question of uh, assumptions made to, uh, well, any estimation comes with assumptions. And our assumptions are not as robust, we must confess. This is aimed at giving an indicative number. And if you attempt such retrofitting, what could be a possible degree of benefits? Uh, what we assumed there is there is no uh, resistance as such in the sense, if we convert it to this, what happens? Now, the behavioral pattern and resistance to change is considered in terms of barriers. What are the barriers that essentially reflect in the behavioral change, a resistance to that? We found that it is not safe. So people refuse to change to bicycle because it is not safe. Okay? So in order to avoid that particular barrier, how do we inculcate the habit of going by bicycle in people, there are a list of policies that we talked about, like, you know, create a kind of respect to those people who bicycle. Right now, in the, in the conditions are such, if you use bicycle, you'll be treated like an inferior creature on the road. Change that. 
if you change that, that assumption is already taken care. So in our study, we did not portray that it can be done. This is a potential way to do it, but in, how, in case we have to do it, these are the barriers that you need to address by means of certain policies that we talked about. All right. Uh, possibility of GEF, we have already done a project on including uh, improving roads with corridors for walking uh, and accounted for GHG benefits and that became part of GEF project in one of the sustainable cities <coughs> project in India, which was done by the Urban, Urban Development Ministry and UNDP in the office. Uh, it is possible, but not done so much extensively. As I said, co-benefits quantification, I was telling Joe in the morning, co-benefits quantification mechanisms are not in place as yet. It is being developed, but potentially, yeah. OK. I wanted to respond to Deji's comments as well. Well, <laughs> he's from Nigeria, and he knows that <coughs> The distances people move between their homes and their workplaces are quite, they are quite far apart. Lagos has developed as an untamed city, like many urban centers in Nigeria too. And um, there are fundamental planning issues. We have people living in the mega city region as far as people go 30 kilometers to work every day. You can't promote walking for those kind of people. It's not possible, it's not feasible. So what we're thinking of, like I said, medium term, light rail, because the, the rail structure is already on ground. It's not operational. It's been, it's been refurbished now, but it's still the traditional system, about 50 kilometers per hour. It's not the high speed type. Now, if you could improve that infrastructure, the truth is Lagosians, people who live in Lagos, are tired of driving. They're tired of driving long distances. People wake up and leave their houses 5 a.m. in the morning even though they're not going to resume until 8 a.m. But they have to beat traffic, and it's, it's a lot of stress, physiologically and physically. And so if it really, like um, my colleague said, if there is access to decent public transport, convenient public transport, I think some people will actually leave their cars and, and, and get on the train, if that works, for example. OK. Just going to lead in, going to the end of the session. I just put here a few points that uh, to kind of summarize the discussions we had here. Five points. I think that this, the presentation and discussion here show that there is this clear link between uh, transportation, uh, climate change, economic development. The two of transportation, the three show these, uh, and also these is uh, transportation. Is, is being a growing uh, contribution to general greenhouse gas emissions in those countries, developing countries. Uh, we see three countries here where this is happening now, like more and more transportation contribute, in particular urban transportation. And the main cause is, uh, uh, is exactly because when you get richer, in general, road transportation is the mean that people choose to, to move around, and individual modes of transportation, particularly cars. Uh, uh, this is another point. Uh, and this is shown in uh, the presentations, the way cities have been built, and I think the institutions there is very important, particularly the way cities are built, and also the kind of incentives that you have to uh, uh, move to, as you develop, not go to the sustainable path, but, but continue in the sustainable path, like no motorized and public transportation be used, why that we need, you, you mentioned GF, but for example, CDM, clean development mechanism, there is very few projects on transportation. Delhi Metro Actual was the first project to register, and there are only a couple of others, very few projects on, on transportation, buildings also, in some sectors like transportation, has not been uh, at the core of this uh, international mechanism. I think is that one of the issues exactly how to measure is very costly to MERV, they call measure report, but very far in transportation is really difficult and show that actually the change was caused by the mode of transportation. These institutions they have actually don't, don't help. But they also the fifth point is there are actually opportunities to do that. You see that many, uh, countries uh, consider the BRT and other modes uh, of public transportation prioritized and also uh, start seeing people talking about the, the non-motorized modes uh, uh, in planning. This is what something that uh, cities was for cars, not for people, but now people, uh, planners, uh, I'm planner, urban planner, start talking again uh, how to actually uh, as keep 
those modes as you develop don't depend on car. And there are a lot of issues. There are a lot of opportunities that actually, not with a lot of money, that there are a lot of win-win situations that you can uh, stay in the sustainable path. No, don't you just, I don't know if any of you want to say any last point. Uh, yeah, uh, 30 seconds each and then you close the session. Kind of uh, uh, inflammatory point. Uh, uh, why CDM is short on urban transportation projects is one school of thought is for every dollar you put, the return in terms of CO2 coming from urban transport sector is the least compared to forestry and other sectors. That's one reason why it is not so prominent in CDM projects. The second reason is if you actually account for the social benefits coming out of urban transportation infrastructure development, it will definitely overweigh all other sectors as far as social benefit is concerned, but CDM strategically does not account for social benefit altogether, social well-being. That's one of the criticisms CDM takes when it comes to urban transportation. Uh, so it's not that um, uh, methodology, yes, methodological issues are always there, but more than that, the other side of the story is basically this. Um, apart from that, as I said, urban transportation is growing as GHG contributor in the developing world, but I must reiterate, uh, we all must reiterate the fact that the urban sector, urban transportation sector in the industrialized world is equally contributing to GGHZ. Okay, We are just going there, it's, but somebody else is already there. So our effort is basically not to reach that level, but slightly, uh, and settle for a slightly lower level of emissions there. Thank you. Okay, last point. Maybe for in the developing countries, uh, incitation mechanism don't work well because there is not alternative to, uh, to the private car. There is not a public transport which developed, which we can use it and don't use uh, the car. This is also uh, an important uh, point, uh, mainly. Uh, okay, f f uh, that's uh, the end of the session. I would like to thank the audience and the speakers for the interesting discussion. Thank you. Thank you.